Hi everyone, it's Mike at the library again. And once again, I'm here with Casey Armstrong, our director and our special guest, if you remember from last time, Dr. Marcus Germany, a Euclid High School graduate and former page at Euclid Public Library. We're very proud to have him as an alumnus from the library. Uh, Marcus is now a doctor at Metro Health. And even way back then, what was about 10 years ago, Marcus dreamed of becoming a doctor while working at the library. He graduated from the University of Cincinnati with a doctorate in medicine. And he is currently in finishing his residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Metro Health. He'll be finishing that up in June. And he came here straight from work. And Marcus is here to talk with us about vaccinations and what's going on in Ohio with uh, the coronavirus vaccinations. And welcome, Marcus. Thanks for coming again. And awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Good to see you again. So we want to jump right into it. Uh, talk about the vaccination program is well underway in Ohio for the coronavirus. Um, all three of us, I think, are at different stages of the vaccine. You've got yours as a, as a health provider. Uh, way back when, when they first started coming out, I think December, January, mm -hmm. I got my first dose a couple weeks ago and I'm scheduled for the uh, second dose on Sunday. And Casey is on the list right now. On the wait list. <laughs> so Marcus, what have you seen as far as the uh, vaccination rollout in Ohio? Um, how's the program going? What have you been hearing from patients? Things like that. Um, well, once again, thanks for having me, Mike. Um, from what I've seen from my perspective, from my end, is that I didn't think it'd be going this quickly, but it's going much more quickly and much more smoothly than I thought it would be going um, at this time. I know the, the president wanted it originally to have everyone be uh, eligible by May 1st, and I think he just pushed it up by, I don't know, two weeks or three weeks. So hopefully by uh, mid-April, we can all be at least eligible, and I think Ohio is uh, doing a fantastic job at keeping keeping pace with the president's, uh, president's goals. Uh, at least for our region, Northeast Ohio, there's been a kind of a boom in areas and places and um, venues for which to get it. There's been a uh, mass participation from pharmacies, including CVS, Drug Mart, Wal uh, Walgreens, um, and the like. Uh, there's been kind of like large mass gatherings at like the Wilson Center downtown in Cleveland State. And then kind of like pop up or drive through uh, vaccination um, sites such as the the sites that through uh, Metro Health and other institutions in the city so it's 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 been it's been a great um kind of like ramp up for patients and people all, all over the, the city and the state to get their uh vaccines and Ohio has kind of rolled it out in stages it was uh originally health providers like you first responders people like that and professions that uh, you know really needed to deal with those health conditions and then they expanded to ages uh, lowering the age requirement every couple of weeks. And now I think Ohio is at 16 and over. Mm -hmm. Anybody of mm -hmm. that age is eligible to sign up for the vaccination. So I did mine at the Wolstein Center uh, two and a half weeks ago. And when you scheduled the appointment, you pick a time, a day. I scheduled for 11.30 a.m. on a Sunday. Didn't, not knowing what to expect, I got there early. About I walked in about three minutes before 11. I was out of there before 11.30. So my appointment was 11.30 and I was done before then. It was a real smooth process, very easy to do. Um, you just go in, they tell you, go sit down over here. The guy comes along and asks you a couple of questions. Another guy behind him gives you the dose and they say, if you wanna sit here and wait 15 minutes, then you can see if you feel any uh, side effects. So I waited a few minutes. Everybody around me looked like they were all waiting. Nobody had any problems. So then you just leave. It was pretty smooth. Um, and Casey, you said you just set yours up recently. So what was the process of setting up yeah. like for you? So the link is in the uh, comments, but everybody mm -hmm. please go to gettheshot.coronavirus.ohio.gov. And um, right away, you just type in your zip code and we were able to uh, see all of the locations that were available to get the shot. Now I had to do a little bit more digging because I specifically want the Johnson and Johnson shot. I said, if I'm going to do this, I only want one shot. <laughs> I don't want to go back. So, but there are several locations on the website where it allows you to choose whether or not you want the uh, Moderna shot or the Johnson and Johnson shot or the Pfizer shot. So you got to do a little bit more digging into each specific location. But if you're willing to invest the time, um, you can choose your shot. If you don't care, 
then you can find, usually right away, you can find a, a location, like you said, Mike, that has some times available. And if not, they seem to all have a wait list where they will text you or email you when an appointment is available. And right now the Wolstein Center is not scheduling anything because between yesterday, April 6th, and I think the 26th, they are doing the second doses for people. Starting, I think, April 27th, then they're doing the Johnson & Johnson shop for anybody that has not scheduled yet. But as of the time we're filming, they have not opened up appointments for that yet. They will, I don't know exactly when, probably within the next week or two, they'll be starting scheduling the Johnson Johnson shot for the Wolstein Center. So don't rush right this moment to try to get the Johnson and Johnson shot at Wolstein. You won't be able to get in on that for a couple weeks yet, but they'll right. be doing that soon as soon as they finish all the first round of people that signed up. So, and I just read uh, earlier today that Ohio is at about 32.8% people getting the first dose of vaccination so far, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I heard it or I read it is above the national average. So Ohio, as Marcus was saying, is doing pretty good with the rollout. And Cuyahoga County is actually a few percentage points ahead of that 32.8%. I figured exactly how much. It's not quite 40%, but we are in this county above the overall rate for the state. So it's actually, hey Mike, I think. Mm -hmm. We have a few Facebook questions already. Do you mind if I? Asking sure, you. go ahead. Okay. So uh, Kelly Sullivan, who is my sister, is on the line. She said, hi, Dr. Germany. Welcome back. She Thank said you. she's excited Thank to you. see you. She says right. the information you gave last time was very useful, and you inspired her to go get the first shot. Excellent. So she has a couple questions. One, any advice for large gatherings, um, especially when you might have a combination of vaccinated people and unvaccinated people? And then she said she really has some side effects from the first shot. And so now she's nervous about getting the second shot. So any advice for dealing with her fears? And what if uh, the next shots produce worse <laughs> side effects? And then the last question was any a real plan for children getting vaccinated? And what should parents be uh, doing and saying? Mm -hmm. So th the first question was about large gatherings advice. Yeah, you know, the the CDC, uh, the Center for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, is uh, updating their their guidelines and their recommendations almost almost daily for folks who've been vaccinated. That includes large gatherings, uh, travel, and uh, just small gatherings indoors. Um, you know, it's it's hard to know if anyone's been vaccinated just by looking at them, unless they have mm -hmm. that 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 card. So there's it's, it's always a good idea to practice good. Uh, social responsibility, mask wearing, and just keeping your distance, unless you can say for sure that everyone at your gathering has been has been vaccinated. So, it, it, you know, when in, when in doubt, uh, be safe with your mask. Um, I know we are starting to get towards hugs and, and you know, kind of closer contact, handshakes and the like. Um, and good hand hygiene mm -hmm. is uh, still recommended. Wash your hands, soap and water, as as was always recommended before the before the pandemic. And then sanitizers when, when you are when are available. Um, so okay. I would say for large gatherings to, um, if you can't, uh, if you can't be sure that everyone's been vaccinated, at least with both vaccination or both uh, shots, or at least has completed a series and has um, completed the, the necessary, I guess, two weeks uh, kind of post vaccination period, it's still good practice to wear your mask. Okay. Um, the second question is about symptoms, yes? Yeah, so she has some side effects after the first shot. So she wanted some advice on dealing with her fears and what <laughs> should happen. What should she do if the side effects are worse the mm -hmm. second go around? <laughs> um, I, I try and tell patients and, and others who ask me the question about the side effects is that that's just evidence that your immune system is working. Oh, that's um, good. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, I, I had very minimal side effects and I'm just like, did it, did it work? Did it, did it take? But uh, never to worry that. The side effects are just that your body's natural response to kind of recognizing that that foreign uh, particle we call the mRNA and uh, mounting a response and making its own antibodies to it. Um, it requires energy. It requires you to feel a little bit uh, kind of off. You know, you may get the uh, sweats, chills, muscle aches, things like that, almost like flu-like symptoms um, after one or both shots. And that's that's expected. Okay. We all, we, we expect that, those symptoms to last. Um, I usually say between 24 and 48 hours. 
Um, just like last time, I, I still promote hydration, uh, Tylenol, Motrin, if um, recommended for you. Okay. And um, just kind of just resting, taking Rest. it easy. And if you can schedule either one of your vaccinations around an off day or some time you'll, or someday you'll have some downtime, it would be recommended. Okay. And our third question. And then question, the last question was on um, children, plan for vaccinations for children. We well, you know our what, adolescents and what uh -huh. the, okay. our adolescents uh, 16 and older can receive, uh, I think it's Pfizer, mm -hmm. and then Moderna is 18 and over. But as far as the, the younger ones going, we're, I haven't read anything that um, it's been approved yet. And I don't think it has been. I, I do think that they are either considering studies or starting smaller, um, kind of you know ramping up the, the research there. But just for now, we haven't uh, cracked that, that question. And that just leaves us to you know, more questions about what about school and summer events. Well, traveling. summer vacation, yeah. I think that's what parents really want to know. Mm -hmm. What like mm -hmm. parents might be vaccinated and ready to go and travel mm -hmm. and go to parks and stuff, but because children haven't, mm -hmm. parents should still be cautious about their children could, and masking and socially distancing, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, I would say if you if you can travel to a more secluded um, space, such as you know a beach house or kind of like a, a beach or a cabin or something, you may be okay. Mm -hmm. If you know that everyone is asymptomatic, there have been no possible exposures, and all the adults who are eligible have been vaccinated. But as far as kind of like, you know, the, the going out to larger cities or, or mass events, we haven't had much guidance on that yet, but I would uh, refer everyone to the CDC website just to see what their updated uh, uh, travel plans are and what their updated um, recommendations are for children. And we did just post that CDC information in the chat. Good. Okay. Good. So Mike, back to you. Well, it sounds like your sister might've had worse side effects than I did. I just <laughs> had a sore arm for I don't know, most of Sunday. Mm -hmm. okay. It wasn't even that bad. It felt like, uh, you know, if you play ball and the season is over and then you pick up the softball or baseball, or whatever, the next season start growing in your arms a little sore. So that lasted maybe a day for me. And then maybe the 24 hours later, if you pressed on that spot, it was a little sore. But beyond that, I didn't have any side effects. And I hear the second shot, you can feel a little bit worse. So I am kind of getting my aspirin ready. Got it okay. prepared on Sunday morning. First thing, so hopefully I could just rest during that day and that'll be the end of that. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, also, uh, some people can be allergic to vaccines and this one, this one they can as well. But from what I understand, it's not any different than any other vaccine as far as allergies go. There's always the chance of being allergic to vaccines, very small percentage chance. Actually, a friend of mine, she's allergic to it. She found out after she got the first one and had a worse reaction than I expected. And the doctor actually advised her, don't take the second one. So I'm not sure where she stands now, but can you talk about uh, for a minute, Marcus, about uh, possible allergies to vaccines? And this one, from my understanding, vaccine, all vaccines have the chance of people being allergic and that chance is very small. So this one is not any more robust as far as that goes. Right, right. You're exactly right that all vaccines, especially our childhood vaccines, carry some risk of being, um, some having some side effect that we don't anticipate. And it's virtually uh, impossible to anticipate. Um, but I think that's why we, I know that's why we monitor um, folks after they get the vaccination for COVID. Uh, Mike, you can probably speak to this where it's not a, it's not a, you know, you come in, you get a shot and you leave. It's a, you come in, you uh, you, get, you are screened for questions and typical um, um, known adverse reactions. You get the shot and then you're monitored for a period of time because that's when the most dangerous reactions happen or within the first, um, 15 to 30 minutes after you receive mm. the, the vaccine. So it is not uncommon for you to just, you know, mon be monitored, make sure you're hydrated and just to make sure everything is uh, status quo before you before you leave the uh, vaccination site. Um, as far as dangerous side effects, there are, you know, I, I, as we get more and more people vaccinated, the numbers just creep up, but at a very, very, very uh, slim margin that um, people have uh, problems breathing, uh, almost like an anaphylaxis picture or an allergic uh, kind of shock picture. Those are very, very rare. Mm -hmm. They are, they more than, you know, most typically almost always happen in the first 15 to 30 minutes after a new medication or a vaccine. And that's why you're monitored. Um, and you're typically monitored in a setting where immediate help can be available to you. So if you were to experience that, uh, help will be right, you know, right near you. 
And as you were saying, Mike, the doctor might advise you not to take the second uh, vaccination. So the uh, professionals who are giving the shots, Dr. Jeremy, hmm? asking that question of you before they give you the shot? Are they, they are, asking they, about allergies? They are. They're screening for allergies. Um, and it's okay, you know, folks have allergies to eggs, to penicillin, to mm -hmm. peanuts, bees, all sorts of common environmental allergens. And those are not contraindications to the vaccine. Okay. In fact, uh, there's a, and, and historically, an egg allergy was a contraindication to the flu vaccine, and that's since changed, since the preparation of the flu vaccine has, has uh, that's changed. And the same thing is with the coronavirus vaccine, is that you were screened for, you know, have you been sick in the past few days? Have you had any known exposures? Have you had a positive test in the past, uh, I guess, two weeks is a typical uh, time frame? And then they just want to inquire about your allergies to see, you know, who's at risk or for future studies to see how how allergies affect the vaccinations. But at this time, um, to my knowledge, there are no stern contraindications to common uh, allergens in terms of getting the uh, COVID vaccine. Okay, so another question, Dr. Germany is, so like the flu shot, you have to go every year. Mm -hmm. So how long will the COVID vaccine last? And will people have to go back in like six months or a year to get another COVID? Will this become a routine? Like the flu shot? You know, it's it's up in the air. I, I feel like I keep saying that because we don't have <laughs> the answer just yet. But it's it's something that the uh, CDC and the other national uh, scientists and experts are considering. Because as okay. we have, you know, we have strains and they mutate and have variants and such, it may be required or necessary that we have booster immunizations in mm -hmm. some form, just like the flu shot. Um, I know the study, the initial group who was, um, were involved in the kind of the, the breakthrough trials of the vaccine can, um, I was reading on the website of CDC that they are guaranteed through at least six months. Okay. And that is only because that there's, you know, been a very short amount of time that the, that the participants have been vaccinated. Okay. So, it's, you know, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have years and years of uh, participants to study this. We just have kind of the very um, initial study participants in mm -hmm. the fall and, and winter of last year. So they are tracking their immunity to the vaccines for all three uh, brands of vaccine. And then they are relaying it to the American people who have been vaccinated. Okay. Because it's, you know, the first group of uh, people were vac vaccinated coming up from four months ago. So we kind of like to see how, uh, just how long the vaccines last. Okay. And what they're doing for the first uh, group of study participants. Well, you just mentioned uh, a booster. What What is a COVID booster? What did you mean by that? So, it's, you know, you get your first flu shot or for first two sometimes for flu shots when you're a kid. And every year we um, vaccinate against different strains of the flu. It, it's, it's almost a, a, um, a kind of a guess and check kind of game. Mm -hmm. the, the, we anticipate certain strains of the flu. Each year we make vaccinations against that strain. Mm -hmm. And we either get it very right, or some of the years when the flu is very bad, we get it very wrong. So that that's for the flu shot, and then other shots that uh, you receive as as a as a kid, you get them in multiple series, uh, two, three, four yeah. times, just to just to boost your immunity to that uh, disease. Okay. Yeah, when I went, uh, it was the National Guard serving everybody at the Wolstein Center, and I don't know how they do the ranks in the National Guard, so I'll just say private. Um, <laughs> the guy that came first to talk to me, he asked the questions, his name was LeBron. <laughs> name patch on his, on his, on his uh, uniform, so I'll call him Private LeBron. So Private LeBron came up and asked, do you remember taking a survey before uh, you, you filled out for this? Which I didn't really remember. I'm sure I filled something out, uh, you know, when you register for the shot. So I said, no, I don't really remember. So yeah, you know, he went into the questions about, uh, do you have immunity, do you have allergies? A couple of things like that. And then which, which arm do you want it in? I wanted my left arm because I'm right-handed and just in case it was really sore, uh, wanted to be able to do things. And guy right behind him, but another National Guard comes along and he gave it to you. And they don't allow, there they, you know, you see a lot of people putting their selfies up over there. Of their shots they they say no photography no video here um so you couldn't do that sitting at the wolstein center so you're sitting there for 15 minutes what are you gonna do for 15 minutes of course you get out your phone look at your phone and then you know 10 12 minutes later the guy comes up are you how long have you been here i thought he was gonna say get off your phone but uh <laughs> no he just asked me how long i've been there i said that's been about 10 12 minutes and they say 
well, you know yourself better than us. If you want to stay a little longer, you can. You know, we say recommend 15 minutes, but if you want to leave. So I said, all right, I think it's time to leave. And like I said, the people around me that were getting at the same time, they all stayed around a few minutes. I didn't see anybody dragged off on a stretcher or collapsing on the ground. Everybody was just fine. Everybody, uh, you know, got up and left in, in due time. So it was a real smooth process they ran there, and that's that was my experience there. So, Marcus, you got yours way back uh, December, January. Have you had any role in giving the shots and vaccination since then? Um, I'm sure you advise your patients on, you know, same type of things we're talking about here. What has your been? What has been your involvement with any vaccinations since that time? Yeah, so I, and it's funny you ask that. Yesterday, I just signed up for a uh, vaccination kind of a distribution center through Metro at Metro's Parmer location. I'll be there on Saturday the 17th, early in the morning, starting at 6:30, and I'll be there till noon giving vaccinations to uh, all who are eligible. Which hopefully by that time will be everyone above the age of uh, uh, 16. Um, but before this, I know that a lot of um, Physicians have been involved, nurses and, um, and um, pharmacists have been giving vaccinations. So pretty much everyone who is credentialed and licensed to administer vaccines has been asked to step up in, in, the, in the role. And then other um, staff throughout the hospital systems have been there to, to uh, guide traffic and guide folks and monitor and provide everything else that they would need. But it's kind of all hands on deck when, uh, when, the, when at least Metro Health has asked their um, Immunization are uh, authorized providers to um, be be present at their vaccination sites. Well, that's great. That's, I'm sorry, that's Mike. One of the reasons why Ohio is uh, above the national average, involving yeah. everybody like Correct. you. Yeah. Correct. Dr. Jeremy, we have another Facebook question. I think this is similar to parents and children, but um, what what happens if you have a one family member who has the shot? And uh, another another adult family member in the house who ha hasn't got the shot, how how should they coexist? <laughs> what happens in in the house? What should be what should they be doing? Well, they should be celebrating the person who got the shot for sure, right? And then kind of giving the a mean mug or a, a side eye to the other person, letting them know <laughs> that it's time for them to get the shot. Well, but they um, could be like me. I'm on the list. <laughs> I, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. It's 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 okay that you know we. <laughs> As long as you are making strides towards getting the vaccine, we won't we won't uh, disrespect you too much. <laughs> uh, but as far as home living conditions, I think everything we we did before the vaccines kind of rolled out in mass are good mm -hmm. things to practice. Again, hand hygiene, wearing masks uh, in the house. Yes. Um, I think you know if um, symptoms are if you're asymptomatic. And mm -hmm. you haven't, you know, traveled to any any endemic areas. If there's no concerns for um, spreading the virus, you may be okay if you, you know, as you were before. Okay. Um, proper disinfectant and you know, good hygiene uh, with that. But again, the CDC is is giving out uh, advice all the time about how to okay. handle unvaccinated homes, partially vaccinated homes, and uh, fully vaccinated homes. Okay. And then I say at the same at the same instance, you might you, if you experience any symptoms, you have everyone tested. Um, so, everyone who is in close contact should be uh, tested if any symptoms or concern comes about. Okay. There have been a few cases where someone I've seen in the news where somebody has gotten the complete vaccination series, Doctor Germany, and then they still tested positive for COVID. Is that mm -hmm. the exception? Um, it, I don't know if I would say exception, but it is expected. Um, the vaccines are, uh, in terms of uh, being effective, they're high 90s. Um, and that's that's true for, um, their effectiveness is true for getting the disease and are preventing disease and preventing severe disease. So it's it's not a total protection, whereas if you take both uh, all vaccination, you complete a series that you are completely immune to the, the virus, you can still get it. Okay. But it is, it is, uh, tailored to make your disease course much less severe mm -hmm. and make you much less likely to have severe disease. Yes. So yes, it is still it is still possible for you to catch the uh, the virus yes. and to still have complications from it. And that's why we still encourage everyone to, to follow social responsibilities until we can uh, get this under control. So it's 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 a hope, but it's not a not a savior just yet. Yeah, my understanding is say whatever my percentage chance of contracting coronavirus or being affected by it, the vaccine 
say it's 96% effective, mm -hmm. I have a 96% less chance of whatever my chances are. After exactly. I get those exactly. Okay. So that's not 0%, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's certainly effective. And if you do catch it, then it would make the, uh, make the symptoms less. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I remember one time reading that uh, reading parenting books doesn't necessarily make you a better parent, but right. wanting to read parenting books makes you a better parent. So seeking that information out, wanting to seek that out. So Casey, if you're somebody that's already on the list, but you haven't got the vaccine, you're already a person that's uh, alert to the things that you need to do to mm -hmm. mitigate the, the, the circumstances. So you're one of those that uh, even if you're in the house, even if somebody's in the house with somebody else that's vaccinated they aren't, if they're on the list, there's somebody that's probably already taking precautions mm -hmm. toward uh, not spreading that virus. Right. So that would be- So uh, here's a, another Facebook question, Dr. Germany. Um, for the families that are still dealing with active COVID-19 cases, what are the quarantine rules? Does everyone still have to stay quarantined? Does the CD still, CDC still contact families and individuals? You know, luckily, well, I guess, uh, luckily I haven't come across many people or as large a number of people who have been COVID positive recently. Okay. So unfortunately, I haven't had to review those guidelines, but for the purpose of this question, it's not too fortunate. Um, I honestly don't know what they're saying now about uh, quarantine. As far as I know, it hasn't changed, but I, I, I would uh, check the website on that. Um, if, if someone is positive, I think they should still be mindful of the other folks who have not gotten the vaccine or who mm -hmm. choose not to or mm -hmm. who cannot get it for a variety of reasons. But I, I think that the quarantine um, should still be taken seriously, even if someone has gotten the vaccine, particularly an elderly person with multiple uh chronic conditions because like mm -hmm. we like we said they can still uh contract the contract the virus virus leslie adams is saying hi marcus hi leslie <laughs> hi leslie <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say hi to us mike <laughs> oh you do that tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Jeremy, I wanted to, one of the discussions that Mike wanted to make sure we hit on was the, the fears for minority communities. And, you know, as I talk to family and friends as an African-American woman and I read social media postings, there's still a lot of fear, still a lot of comments about the Tuskegee experiments. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, because I think people logically know that the vaccine is safe. However, how do we really address those fears? Um, hmm. You, I think we have a responsibility and a duty to acknowledge the uh, previous dealings of healthcare with people of color, especially African-Americans in the Tuskegee mm -hmm. study and other studies that were uh, less than ethical. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, that it's uh, probably a, a good uh, practice and appreciated by patients that we that we you know put our put the onus on ourselves you know as as a provider I had nothing to do with the Tuskegee study absolutely nothing I, I well you you quite you're lifetime. still young Marcus so <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think you were born yet <laughs> I was not I was not that that uh, experiment took place in thirty two and it lasted until uh, seventy two so uh, it missed me by almost twenty years I missed it by almost twenty years however I um, kind of acknowledge that that um that event or that, that, that uh, longitudinal study and check in to see what patients understand. What, what do the patients understand about the vaccine right, um, right now? You know, you know what, where do they get their information? What do they understand? What have they heard? What do they think right. is true versus false? And I try and guide them into um, making their own decision. You know, I, I like, like we said last time, I can't force a patient to, to do anything and I would never want to. Mm -hmm. But I always want to make sure that they have an informed, uh, that they make informed decisions. Correct. And that they get their information from trusted resources and, and kind of uh, be able to uh, dispel any myths. And then to take it a step further to educate other people who may be getting the same news or similar news from similar uh, outlets. And well, that's, that way, I'm, I'm glad you said that because my sister said, can you address folks who think that the vaccine will include a microchip? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, it does not. Quite honestly, it does not. Uh, <laughs> no chips, no 5G, 
no no changes to your DNA does not do anything like that. Right. Um, so when when the when the healthcare provider is giving the shot, you can literally see them put the vaccine in the needle, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you can see the whole process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we can see they at least from my experience that they did not come pre kind of pre drawn up. Mm -hmm. That we are we are supposed to you know take the the vial of the of the vaccine, draw it up in a syringe, uh, clean your skin off, and poke you. Uh, that okay, way you can so see they can they can kind of see. I know microchips are tiny, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but you know you think when they microchip a dog, you know you can see that you can feel that you can see it's not. I mean it's small, but it's not that small. I I I don't. I'm not familiar with the dog microchips. <laughs> Not at all, but I can I can tell you you won't feel anything microchipish under your under your own <laughs> arm when you get the when you get the vaccine. Okay. Well, with the millions of people, and I don't know the exact number, but I know it's into the millions of people receiving the vaccine. Based on the Marvel Comics movies, I think one of them would have become Spider Man or Captain America or something yeah. by now with uh, <laughs> with things like that going into it. So I think with none of that happening, there's no evidence of a microchip in there. Now, no one's uh, swinging from webs or uh, no. That always happens. That I know these, of. With these crazy <laughs> injections of things, so mm -hmm. that hasn't happened in the uh, United States yet. So we're probably okay as far as the microchips go. So uh, Leslie about said it. you used to babysit her son, Doctor Jeremy. I did. I did. He's probably about uh, twenty-seven now. Oh wow! Oh. No, he's not that old. He, he's not that. Old. That means she's about sixty. Um, <laughs> not even close. No, I'm not that old just yet. <laughs> so we talked uh, about it for a minute before but how do we now set up appointments for the vaccine there's the i think we linked it in the chat there's the get a shot website mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can you can go to individual pharmacies or hospitals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, websites and sign up um mm -hmm. call so can people still make an appointment with their their doctor their regular doctor to get the vaccine dr germany so i know at least for metro health that uh there's Everyone who is eligible, 16 and older, there's already an order in the system, in our system okay. that um, you you have a a vaccine order written. You just have to schedule an appointment to receive it. Um, and I think us institutions around the city are doing uh, similar similar things. And of course, the website is for you know the kind of the the retail pharmacies and and the like. And then uh, CSU or the Wilson Center has their has their website. So I, it's it's certainly growing. I think when I was trying to schedule my grandmother back in late January, February, that maybe two or three pharmacies had options and it wasn't as a, as a readily available as it is now. But I think we're doing great things to try and speed up the vaccination rate. And I, and I hear that more, um, more ways to sign up are forthcoming, especially as Johnson & Johnson rolls out their, their, uh, their dose. We'll have much more availability and it'll be uh, much more uh, accessible to everyone. So, Dr. Germany, have you seen or heard much about uh, Johnson & Johnson? Is it uh, much different receiving that than the others? Have you had much experience with that one? You know, we talked about it last week at, uh, at work, and we had, to my knowledge, we hadn't received it uh, just yet, unless something's changed over the week and in the early part of the week. We hadn't uh, received it enough to make it um, kind of an option. You know, when we, when we sign up for the, the vaccine through Metro, you you kind of sign up and you get, you get the vaccine that you that you receive, whether it's Pfizer, or Moderna, or uh, Johnson and Johnson, and that's that's true for everyone except for the 16 to 18 year olds, where the 16 and 17 year olds have to receive the, the Pfizer vaccine, and it's been studied and, and approved for those folks. But I always tell people not to not to get lost in the in the details and to get the, the get the vaccine as early as they can and to get the first one that's available to them. Um, whether it be Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson and Johnson, obviously Johnson and Johnson has the added advantage of being one shot, and the Pfizer uh, has the the uh, the added advantage of being only a three week break between uh, between shots. But whenever you are eligible and whenever you can get it, I would suggest signing up as soon as possible, uh, okay. regardless of the the brand. Doctor Germany, for those of us who do take the shot, the vaccine at a different location, should we be notifying our primary? care physician that we did get the shot um you definitely can it's definitely uh, always you know always good to keep your primary care physician updated i don't think you need a special appointment just to go in and say hello i got a shot to buy yeah um, but maybe at the next time you see them just let them know where you got it what it's, what symptoms you experience 
how you thought it was going that way they have more uh kind of more of a of a push to get other people who are a little bit more hesitant to get the shot okay and then i know you already we talked about this but we have some folks that are joining us late dr germany do you mind sharing what it's like getting the shot because you oh, did sure. have your shot can you tell us what you felt like in the process sure. again um, I, I, I was not one of the ones who were, you know, jumping on the bandwagon immediately. Like I, I was a little hesitant. I wanted to do my own research. And once I did, I realized that the, that the shot was, uh, was very, very safe and very necessary to end the pandemic. So I received my shot, uh, in the middle of December of 2020, uh, through Metro health and then got the Pfizer version. So, uh, I got the first shot on a... Thursday, no, sorry, Friday. I had the first shot on a Friday and it went well. It went well. I didn't have any um, issues, no complaints, maybe a, like a little bit of soreness at the injection site, uh, but it actually hurt much less than the uh, flu shot. Uh, so I experienced very mild symptoms with that. And then three weeks later, I was back for the, the second and final dose and I got it in the same arm and that one hurt a little bit more. It felt like a, a bigger pinch and my arm was a little bit, a little bit more uh, tight. And uh, I experienced uh, a little bit of fatigue or tiredness, and um, just uh, some what we call malaise. You're just feeling kind of kind of out of it for about you know, a day and a half. So I got the second shot on a Thursday afternoon. Friday was a little bit uh, didn't feel the best. Got a lot of sleep Friday night. Woke up Saturday like nothing had ever happened. Um, didn't require any Motrin, Tylenol, but I know a lot of um, or a fair amount of people ha who have taken that for the the pain or the a little bit of fever, just feeling uh, kind of um, crappy. So what were you initially hesitant about? Like, why were you nervous as a physician, especially? Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't have the information that I needed. I didn't have any of the data, the effective rates. You know, it's it was kind of like, try this new product, and then here it is. And mm -hmm. that could have been my own, um, you know, just missing information. But I wanted to do my own research, not rely on any uh, media outlets or Facebook or, or whatever is that going out there these days to see like what the effective what the effectiveness was what side effects i should i should experience and and how safe this shot was and a little bit of the the biology and chemistry behind the, the vaccine and it's a little different from the flu shot where we have years and years of uh, knowledge of what mm -hmm. happens when you get the flu yeah. shot this is a brand new thing that's mm -hmm. you know based on some research previously but never really used before so you, should, you definitely why wouldn't you have those concerns Definitely. Dr. Jeremy, no, no symptoms after the first shot, but then mild symptoms after the second shot. Exactly. Mike, so far, you've had the first shot. What were your, mm -hmm. what was your experience? So I, you know, I, even the shot itself, I barely felt them punching into my arm. Um, I waited the 15 minutes or so, didn't feel anything, went home, drove home from the Wolstein Center. My arm was a little sore. I play I don't anymore, but I played softball for years. And at the end of every season, usually the softballs go into the basement and stay there till next spring. You get the balls out, you start throwing your arms sore. That's how my arm felt. A little bit okay. sore from, you know, not throwing So like you were working while. out. Yeah. Uh, okay. And that's about it. It felt that way for maybe 24 hours. But, you know, it was a very limited soreness. It wasn't really anything that you sat there holding your arm all night. It was just a little bit sore. And then after a day or two, maybe if you press right on that spot. There was a, you know, hurt just a little bit. That's about it. So I didn't feel any fatigue or, you know, symptoms of a flu or anything like that. They say the second one, like Marcus experienced is a, maybe a little bit more of that. So I'm kind of anticipating that and I get it Sunday morning. So I got all Sunday to hopefully recover and be ready to go into work on Monday. <laughs> so Dr. Jeremy, some of the research you were doing, was that with the CDC or were you looking at like medical journals? Like what, what are you recommending for folks to do their own research? Oh, I would definitely do a kind of trusted government uh, research. We keep plugging the, the CDC. Um, if you can't find it, I like to, to use CNN as a, as a kind of a, a trusted resource where it's not as uh, polarizing. They kind of stick to the facts and give you mm -hmm. the actual websites where they get their information from so you can you can uh browse it yourself um your do primary the do position. the hospital so doc i remember when i would take my kids for their physical exams and they would get a shot they would give me this printout mm -hmm. of here's the vaccine here's the information about the vaccine are they still doing that or no they are they are you 
you get a information sheet at the time of vaccination is actually required by by law that the the center gives you uh, the reading material and the, the literature for you to understand what the vaccine is, how it was developed, um, kind of at a at a not at a scientific level, but at a level that most people can uh, can understand and to be safe and how what, how to report symptoms and um, if you need any other uh, medical treatment or how to uh, get in touch with a with a provider who was either associated with the site or at the at the site. Um, so it is so required that you receive some literature to read. Did you get that, Mike, at the Wolstein Center? Did you get literature? No, I don't remember getting any handouts or anything like that. Okay. Perhaps when you signed up, Mike, was there a link in the, because uh, I, I just signed two people up in there. The reading was in kind of like the appointment uh, there, kind of confirmation. There probably was. Yeah. Um, and I might have either not <laughs> wanted to click on it, forgot to click on it, clicked on it, forgot okay. to click on it again. So then everybody make sure you slow down when you're making your appointment <laughs> and read the information that's in the email, I mean, in the <laughs> registration form. And I, did, I said earlier, the guy, when you first get there and they come and ask you, you basically, are you ready to do it? A couple questions. He asked me, do you remember taking a survey when you signed up for this, which I probably did. And I said, no, I don't remember because I didn't remember <laughs> But uh, I know I try, you know, I tried to sign up a couple different places before the Wolstein Center, and I do remember different questions that they had asked about things before that. So I'm sure I did, and I just literally did not remember, but did fill it out mm -hmm. online. So now, uh, Marcus, last time uh, we talked, it was a month or so ago, a little bit more than a month, and you were just saying people coming into your office asking kind of all kinds of questions about the shot, the vaccine, you know, should they do it, what their fears were. Are you hearing different types of questions now? Are people still uh, as wary of it as they were a few weeks ago, or what's uh, your patients like now, as far as that goes? Um, a lot of a lot of the same questions. Um, not too too much of a variance there, but I think what's happening now is that we're seeing kind of like family members of the of my patients getting vaccinated, so they want to know what it's like, what what to expect, and I just tell them to say, you know, if a if a husband and wife comes to the appointment. And the wife has received the vaccine, and the husband uh, is waiting for his. We're kind of skeptical on the fence, and he's a patient. So I'll just say, "Why don't you ask her? She got it. You know what to experience." So I, I like to kind of put the conversation on on someone that the patient can trust even more than me, a family member, uh, a caretaker, or anything that they can see. You know, what did you feel like on the first day? How about the second day? Because I, I unfortunately can't be there each day to see exactly how they're feeling. I can give like a like an aggregate of of um, commonly reported symptoms, but if they want kind of like a play-by-play, -play, then uh, a family member will probably be best. And okay. are the, are, Casey, you had talked about this before, like a family member might say they don't want to get the shot, but you don't really know the reason why they don't want to get the shot. And then you, I don't know, those conversations might be hard to get out of them, the real reason. Maybe the real reason is they have some kind of medical condition that they, that you don't know about, that they haven't disclosed, they don't want to talk about. And that's the reason they don't want to do it, but they don't want to get into it. So are those kind of conversations, Margaret, like you were just talking about uh, the office visit with the people? How do you get the, how do you get that information out of somebody when they say they don't want to get the shot, but the real reason they don't want to get the shot is that they have uh, some kind of chronic disease that they really haven't disclosed to people. And mm -hmm. that's the reason and the, the fears behind that. Certainly. And I think that speaks to the importance of being interviewed alone. You know, if, if a family comes in or a, a husband and wife or whoever comes in as, as a duo or a trio, uh, it's important to get that patient kind of squared away alone to see what their, what their true fears are. Because like you said, they may not want to disclose in front of their family or caretaker, but you as a, as the, uh, or me as a physician wants to uh, get down to the, to the bottom of what they are concerned about, you know, cause their concerns are only word blocks to their, to their uh, health. And you and, and me as a as a physician once you know I, I really want to know why they haven't signed up or why they don't want to sign up or you know what their their barrier to at least having the the information to make that decision one way or the other what, what that barrier is. And the people with those underlying conditions, you always hear that's the people that really need the shot. You they need it. They should have uh, gotten it yesterday. Yeah, they should have gotten it yesterday. That's what I tell people. Yeah. But there may be people whose physician may be, there may be some things going on. I don't know. They may be prepping for some kind of surgery or major thing. I, I don't know. I right, don't right. know with the doctor, but there may be some people whose doctor has advised them, like you said, 
if there was a, an allergic reaction, a doctor may say, don't get the exactly. second shot. Exactly. So those are one-on-one -on -one conversations. So mm -hmm. I think people do need to be mindful when they're, they do know that they have their health conditions. They just might not want to say, I'm not getting the shot. And, mm -hmm. Cause then mm -hmm. that might make other people think, well, oh, something is wrong. I don't want to get the right. shot either. Right. But they specifically have something going on that you may not. And I know a lot of the fears are, you know, spread by some of our leaders, the media, things like that. Yeah. I say, look at actions more than words because you hear a lot of the people that, uh, you know, say this is all overblown or it's not a real mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people, you hear they got the shot. So yeah. take that into consideration when you're hearing all this information, if you're afraid because they say it's overblown, you don't need it in that. Well, look what mm -hmm. these people are actually doing. A lot of these people, um, they're, they're getting a shot. So they're taking well, the I, I was watching an interview with Will Smith because he did the movie I Am Legend. And he said, do not <laughs> believe that movie. <laughs> 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 he said... You know, he said, you know, everybody that is for entertainment, it is fiction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's oh the one goodness. where they're all turning to zombies, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had a zombie outbreak from the vaccine. No we haven't had uh, people turning into superheroes or any kind of mutants, good or bad. <laughs> Very few um, really bad side effects. Um, I mean, if, if there was an outbreak of really bad things coming from this, you would have heard about it. Definitely. Yeah, be, Definitely. Be, yeah because the vaccine day. started and you said you took yours in December. They mm -hmm. started in November? Mm -hmm. As far as I know, it was late fall, mid fall was uh, kind of the, the first uh, stages in the first distribution. And, and again, they had had the trials running for several weeks and months before that. Okay. Yeah, so we, we put in enough time that if anything horrible was going to happen, we mm -hmm. would start noticing that mm -hmm. this isn't working. Okay. Right. Right. So, uh, Dr. German, do you have any thoughts on how long this whole vaccination process will be going on? Is it going to take till the end of the year before we get to the level we need uh, into next year? What do you think? You know, I, I don't know honestly. I uh, I hope as soon as possible, but that's uh, that's all I can ask for. I, I don't know what the uh, coming logistics would be to make the vaccines even more readily available than they are now. Um, so I think we just need to all be patient and sign up as soon as we can, and you know, not worry about the details of which back which uh, brand I'm getting. We just you know sign up and make sure to show up on your appointment date, uh, ready to go. That way we won't waste any vaccines or have any uh, missed doses or unnecessarily uh, unused doses. We'll use the old marketing campaign. Just do it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I think Nike would be okay with us borrowing that slogan yes. for tonight. <laughs> All right. So I don't know. Does anybody else have any questions in the chat? Or yeah, I'm, I'm double checking. Started? So if anyone has any questions, we got a few more minutes with Dr. Germany. Um, Mike, what's the next date that Dr. Germany will be visiting with us again? It's May. Uh, do you remember exact date, Marcus? Is it May fifteenth? Couldn't tell you. Sometime in May and sometime in June. It's in my <laughs> calendar. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I don't know why May fifteenth is stuck in my head, but it's sometime right around that day. So uh, okay, so one is on Instagram though, and then the yeah, other I one think is the on next Facebook. one will be on Instagram Live, and you won't be with us on that one, Casey. Yeah, I'll miss that one, but I'll yeah. chime in. I, I, I'll chime in. You won't see my face, but I'll chime in because I know I'll probably have some more questions. And That's why I, 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 I'm bringing these questions literally from my family and friends saying, what are your concerns? Dr. Germany is going to be on the Zoom. <laughs> Let's get them answered. <laughs> um, so I'll be polling some more friends and family and library community members to see, get ready for the May chat. <laughs> and then we have the third one will be in June. I think uh, June 10th, maybe. I can't remember the exact date, but yeah, it's pretty much in the middle of each month. Mm -hmm. So just look at our website, look at our Facebook. We'll be promoting it. Uh, you'll be able to log in at the last second if you don't hear about it well enough in advance. So uh, uh, May 10th on Instagram, that's the next one. And then uh, Kelly is saying, thank you, Dr. Germany, for answering her questions. And thanks, certainly. Mike, for your funny stories and experience. <laughs> she, she thought this was so informative. She has to go, but she would definitely be watching again. 
Perfect. So. Great. Perfect. We already have at least one person for our next one, Marcus. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks for having me again. It's, it's, yeah. it's uh, good to do these and make sure everyone's uh, on the same page or on a similar, uh, in the same book. I'll put it that yes. way. Yes. Yes. And so this this will be recorded. It's being recorded, and we will be posting this to our YouTube page, so people can watch it again later and share it with family and friends. And we really appreciate you joining us this evening, Dr. Germany. Certainly. Thanks for having me. And before everybody goes, I want to plug one program we have coming up, and I know the date for this one is May thirteenth. Uh, we have Paul Orlowski, a Cleveland legend in the newscaster. He's written a book. And he will be joining us in one of these sessions on May 13th. So look for that. And uh, he's got some good stories. I heard him on the radio and I didn't know who it was before, uh, before I listened to it. He caught my attention and I listened to it for like 10 minutes. So and this is a good book. So join <laughs> us for that as well. And I'll say if you are a Euclid resident, keep an eye out for the Euclid Observer and the library liaison that were mailed to your homes. Uh, all of the library programming and information is listed in both the paper and the liaison. So check us out there for all of our upcoming programs. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Right. Germany. And we'll You're see welcome. you in a month or so. All righty. You all take care. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. All righty.